Well, welcome to the fifth segment in relation to having a happy marriage. That's my heart for you. That's my prayer for you. Uh, marriage, I don't think, is easy. Uh, particularly today, there's so much pressure on marriage. Financial pressure, all kinds of pressure uh, that can cause marriages to blow apart as they are. A, a dime a dozen, basically. And so marriage is something we've got to work on. We've been learning some values, some principles, uh, some ways of God in order to have a healthy marriage. My heart for you is that you will. I've had to work on my marriage, and so I'm speaking from experience on many of these points. In fact, uh, just now while we're filming, uh, in between the segments, my beautiful granddaughter came in and uh, came running up, and she said, Granddad, what are you buying Nan for Valentine's Day? Valentine's Day? To be honest, I didn't even know it was Valentine's Day. Why is that? Well, because I grew up in a generation in New Zealand when Valentine's Day wasn't even a big deal. Uh, and I do see it, obviously, as a little bit of commercialization. If you need a day like that just to buy your wife flowers or cards, uh, I think we need to do it more often and not have those kind of special moments. But enough to say, I've been talking about special moments, her birthday, your wedding anniversary, and now, of course, yes, we have Valentine's Day. And I think the younger generation growing up would certainly, the, the ladies would certainly miss it, men. Listen, if you don't buy them something nice on Valentine's Day, and so my little beautiful granddaughter rebuked me and said, Granddad, uh, listen to me, I'm wiser than you in this area, she said. And so the thing is today, Valentine's Day is important. So I'm going to be buying my dear wife something on the way home. Uh, I'm going to be buying a fish for the barbecue, but I know that won't do, right? I've been talking about it. Uh, but enough to say, you know, maybe a rose or two. I said to Shanae, I'll buy a rose. She said, roses, you know. So the thing is, is that Valentine's Day is a great opportunity to express a bit of love and, and uh, uh, do something for that. The amazing thing is, of course, um, couples uh, don't realize that the, the, the situations you face, everybody faces. A little bit like a kid growing up, you know, going through puberty. For example, so often, the, you know, everyone feels, I'm the only one going through this, but everybody goes through it. I mean, you can think about a lot of things in life. A lot of people think, you know, I often hear, uh, and, and ladies, please, I wouldn't want to have a, a baby for sure. But, you know, when a lady's pregnant and so forth, they, they, like with their first, it's like they're the only one in the world that's having a baby. But, of course, we all came into the world like that. And that doesn't take away, obviously, from the enormity of it and so forth. But often we feel we're the only ones going through a situation. So when our marriage is in trouble, we're th we think sometimes we're the only ones facing this situation. But you're not alone. We all bleed red. We all face situations and very similar situations as well. And so the keys of the kingdom, the keys that God has given us, can help every one of us unlock our potential. Amen. And so people are people. There used to be a song, people are people, whatever they have for breakfast. Men are men and women are women. And we know they are different. As much as the world would try to blend us together and try to have all this different sexuality, men are men, women are women. No two ways about it. And that book, Men Are From Mars, Women From Venus, I mean, I encourage you to read it. Some things may be a little slightly outdated today, but there's a lot of great material in there to see how different we are. And I've been talking about some of those differences, even the way that we respond as men to situations and the way that wife responds to them in various circumstances can be different. Amen. And so men, and just not to recap, but can I just say, ladies, that men need acceptance. Acceptance on who they are, acceptance of their personality, acceptance on what they do in relation to their job. And ladies, he needs your encouragement. He will respond to your encouragement. He needs respect. That's why Ephesians 5.33 says, let the wife see that she respects her husband because it does him good, and in turn he will love his wife as Christ loved the church. And so this, the Bible is great news for a woman. The Bible says a man is to love his wife the, way, the same way that Christ loved the church and gave his wife, his bride, his life for her. And so the Lord, when you think about it, gave up exclusive rights and the privilege of heaven. Of course, a lot of men don't want to give up their single life to some degree. They don't want to give up what they had. They want to try to keep that and be married. It doesn't work. And Jesus gave up the privileges of heaven and humbled himself and gave himself as a servant unto death. And so can I encourage the single people? Don't, you know, listen, don't pray for your wife after you get her. Pray for your wife before you get her. I'm going to be doing a series in relation to 
preparing for marriage. And uh, I want to encourage you, if you know single people, get them to watch it. But here's a tip to help you ladies. When your husband comes home and they just want to sleep, be considerate of their long, hard day. Be considerate of that. You know, I encourage ladies to keep your house tidy. I know it's not easy. you got little kids running around, toys all over the place. Why put them away? Because it's going to be the same tomorrow, right? But, you know, as I said, men go by looks. And so ladies, be a little presentable. And I know it can sound old-fashioned, but men, you know, they've been looking at a beautiful woman at the office and they come home. They don't want to look at a woman who's unkept and all that kind of stuff. And, and so I want to encourage you. Uh, you know, to work these principles. God wants to inhabit your marriage. And praise, of course, is positive. The Bible says it's a good thing to give praise. And it's most important in a marriage for a husband and wife. So let me give you three C's. Number one, control. Control your anger. Control your mood. Men, don't be grumpy. Don't be, um, you know, angry. Please, control that. Ladies, control your emotions a little bit. I know you're an emotional person. But control that. Don't control the other person, but learn some self-control. Learn some commitment, commitment to marriage, commitment to what you vowed. You know, no going back on that. Also, communication. Control, commitment, and communication. Those three C's will help your marriage tremendously. The most important communication area, as they say in a marriage, is number one over finances. Be open about the finances. Share about it. Pray about it. Also, your goals what your dreams are, what your vision are. Also communicate about feelings, how you're feeling, what you're thinking. Children, communicate over the children. Isn't it true, parents, that kids change your life like nothing else? But too often, and particularly the mother, you know, being a mother protective, I've often learned, never get between a mother and her children. It's like, a raw, like the bear and the cubs, you know. But the thing is, is that it's true that nothing changes life like your children. But women can become so emotionally attached to the children that they no longer love their husband. Friend, I want to encourage you today. Kids can change your life. But if we don't train them and influence the kids now, the devil will do it later. We must be the trainer of our children. We must know how to bring up our children in the ways of God. Values are, are, are not taught, but they're caught. And so men, can I encourage you to be the head of the home, the leader, and uh, bring your family to church. We talked about these things. I know kids will change your life like nothing else. They cost money, but they never be cheaper than today. And so respect your children, and they will respect you, because runaway kids often come, come from runaway parents. I want to close this segment, this last segment, this fifth segment on marriage, give you the 10 major reasons in summary for divorce. I hope and pray that these will keep you from going down the path. Number one, I mentioned it in our opening segment, number one is communication breakdown. I hear it time and time again. Counselors hear it time and time again. I just can't talk to him anymore. I just can't talk to her anymore. You know, I know that women have more words than men. And we've talked about listening. We've talked about being attentive and so forth. But communication is important. Number two, the second reason, disagreement on how to raise children. And that's why I mentioned children just in a, a moment ago. I know not every married couple has got children. I know some couples want children, can't have children. I know that uh, some children have left home and all that kind of stuff. But so often parents can argue on how to raise the children. And that can cause divorce. Number three, sexual incompatibility. Well, I want to encourage you, you know, to... Uh, be kind and gentle. And we talked a little bit about this on, in relation to sex and marriage, a very important area. And uh, you need to work on that and you need to uh, read some books and become uh, better at this area. Number four, financial collapse. Financial pressure today is huge. We know that. Everybody wants stuff we can't afford with money we can't, we don't have. But the thing is, is that financial collapse can cause divorce. Number five, different leisure activities. It's amazing how people drift apart begin to form different relationships. Maybe somebody's into running and then the running club and next thing they're running with another uh, man's running with another lady or, you know, all kinds of things, but different leisure activities and people drifting apart. Sure, it's good to have, uh, you know, different uh, things that you like, as I mentioned in the previous uh, segment. You know, uh, it's so important that, that you're able to uh, be able to express yourself, but do things together as well. Number six, poor in-law 
and friend relationships. How many people argue over their, their mother-in-law their, you know, or their father-in-law? They say Adam was in paradise because he never had a mother-in-law. But the thing is, is that is true, that people argue over their parents and other, other spouses' parents and friends. Friends, Bev and I. Uh, Bev, uh, we, when we first got married, I had very strong friends. And, of course, I was getting saved, trying to get my life sorted out. And, and uh, I got a job transfer to Wangarei, which was the best thing ever for us and uh, for my walk in God because it meant I left my friends. My friends were definitely influencing my life, my young married life. Uh, I'd be off to the pub with them and, and spending time with them and not with Bev and so forth, so forth. It caused a lot of pressure. We would argue over our, my friends. And, uh, you know, so this can be uh, a place of, of, of great discussion. Uh, sexual unfaithfulness. This is a big area today. Uh, people think it's all right to go and, and have an affair. And it can happen so easily. People just, uh, you know, open up a wrong door. And so I want to encourage you, don't go down that path. Uh, the Bible says it's grounds for divorce, but a greater, I believe, is forgiveness. And we can forgive when something's happened like that. And uh, sexual unfaithfulness can be a cause for divorce. Wife refusing to clean the house, you know. You might not uh, think that that's a reason for divorce. It's not a reason for divorce, but it's a cause. I'm giving you the top ten causes that were done in a survey. And, uh, you know, where a man, he just gets so frustrated if the house isn't clean. And I know I'm talking about, I guess, uh, you know, when uh, a lady is at home all day. And uh, I know she's busy with the kids and doing everything around the home and so forth. But today, of course, a lot of ladies are out working. And so, you know, it needs to be done together. And, you know, husbands need to be involved in this and so forth and not just leaving it up to the, to the woman. But uh, number nine reason for divorce, it's interesting, it's number nine. And it could be closer up to the top in my view. But physical abuse, physical abuse is a reason for divorce, obviously. And there's, and there's no reason for physical abuse. Uh, men should not be physical, and women should not be physical in their relationship in that area. Number 10, poor, no spiritual relationship. Isn't that interesting? Number 10, the number 10 reason for divorce is poor or no spiritual relationship. And so the word husband, think about this. The word husband in Scripture means man, means mate, uh, even righteous, and can be as full of faith, champion, master, lover, companion. All those things are wrapped up in that word husband. So we're supposed to do three things, men. Guide, guard, and govern. Guide, guard, and govern. Let me give you a scripture as I close out this segment. 1 Peter 3, verse 1. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chest, conduct accompanied by, by, by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward. Merely outward, notice that. It's important to have uh, adornment, but it's not the only thing. Arranging the hair, the wearing of gold, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is a very precious in the sight of God. For in this man in former times, a holy woman who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid of terror. The Bible is still as relevant today as it was when it was written. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them. Dwell with your wife with understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel, as being ears together with joint ears of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. In other words, men, you can pray to your blue in the face, but if you're not honoring your wife, if you're not cherishing your wife, if you're not counting her as pressure, God will, precious, God will not answer your prayer. And so in other words, husbands, make her the queen. She will make you the king. And so you can make your marriage heaven. It doesn't have to be hell on earth, but your responsibility starts with you. Here's another scripture, 1 Peter 3, 8. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil, or reviling or revile, for, uh, but on contrary blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So I want to encourage you today in relation to your marriage. Let me give you quickly just three steps for marriage renewal. Because I know that many people have been wounded in marriage. Many people have been damaged in marriage. 
marriage, maybe you're hurt, you know, you've been disappointed, maybe you got offended, maybe you're losing the fight, maybe you've even lost the fight, lost your feelings to one another. The good news is, the good news is that God has a plan to heal and restore your relationship. God is a God of restoration. And as I've said, and please, with all respect, I don't care how bad it is today, it can be better tomorrow. Jesus speaking in Revelation chapter 2 to the church of Ephesus. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you left your first love. That's what a lot of people feel with their wife or their spouse or their husband. They no longer love them. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I am coming quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Here's a great verse, Jesus being to the church. But remember when I read out Ephesians, Jesus likened the church to a marriage very much, and so the same principles apply. If your love is called for one another, got cold, and your relationship sliding down, and your relationship even has become sickening, hey, step one, remember from where you've fallen. Remember what it was like when you were first married, when you wanted to get married, when you walked down the aisle. Do not try to work up some emotion because the true strength of true love is not emotion, but a decision of the will. I choose to love. And as you choose to love, you will fall in love. The agape love, a commitment to do what is right for someone else regardless of emotions. Jesus didn't say, remember your feelings. He said, remember your actions. Remember your actions, how you used to honor one another, how you used to be sensitive, how you did the little things to impress your partner on the phone all day, <laughs> every day. You know, the flowers, the cards, the chocolates, the notes. How long ago, man, did you say to your wife, I love you? And so remember, remember from where you've fallen and do the works. Number two, repent, repent. Repent is the first word of the kingdom. Remember, the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. You want to walk in righteousness, peace, and joy in your marriage, the kingdom of God, repent. Turn it around. About face. Change direction. So acknowledge the truth. That'll bring revelation. Admit that you're wrong. In other words, confess and adjust your direction, your action. The third step, do the deeds you did at first. And I tell you what, your spouse is sitting there and saying, that would be nice. Jesus didn't say that you better work up some deep feelings for me right now or you're in big trouble. No, simply act the way and do the things you did when the relationship was new and fresh. Invest of time, energy, and money. Regardless how you feel, take your wife on holiday, man. I mean, I tell you, I encourage you. In a few days, you'll see the change. In a few months, you'll feel some satisfaction. And in a few years, you'll be in heaven. Remember, nothing worthwhile is instant. It doesn't happen overnight. People give up too soon, and it takes time to build a relationship. And particularly if it's got broken down, it takes time to rebuild. You know, it takes time to turn it around. You have to commit, endure, persevere, don't give up. So many couples on the outside can look good, got the right clothes, got the right job, got the right house, but on the inside, they're falling apart. I often said of people, you can have six cars in the garage and, but be going nowhere in life. You can have 12 uh, mini suits hanging in the closet, but you can be rotting on the inside. So many people look to another partner to meet their need. But friend, can I encourage you that only God can fulfill your complete need. And so many want their spouses to change, not necessarily for their spouse's sake, but for their sake. And, you know, to fulfill their needs and to fulfill their desires. Friend, as I said, you can't change your spouse. You can only change you. But if you change yourself, become the man or the woman that you know you ought to be, you will find that will produce something extraordinary. Our prayer should be, Lord, change me. And this is not just a one-time decision. You don't just do it once. But day by day, moment by moment, it's a choice. Men, listen now. Woman, respond to loving men. The Bible says that, listen, men, listen, the Bible says her desire will be for you. I'm talking to the men. Your wife's desire will be for you if you love her. And uh, no matter what state you're in, your marriage, your marriage is in right now. If you work hard, it will pay big dividends. It starts with one, you'll see the difference. If both of you can work on it, it's even better still. But it starts with one. If you both commit to work on it, and simply die to yourselves. That's what marriage is all about. Giving of yourself. When you come to the altar, you say, you know, I give you my life, right? 
And so you're dying to yourself, basically. You're giving your life away. And so it's a scriptural principle. And if you're still prepared to do that, you will find you'll have a great life together. You might still have problems from time to time. You might still have challenges from time to time. But if you remain steadfast and obedient, listen now, I promise you, the problems will get fewer. The challenges will get easier. I know what I'm talking about. And your blessings will become larger and more uh, enjoyable. You know, soon and very soon, it's not hard and it's not grueling work because it becomes natural. And so here's three great keys just in closing. Repent, reconcile, and restitute. Or can I put repentance, restitute, and reconciliation? You see, faith is believing what you cannot see will come to pass. Fear is believing what you cannot see will come to pass. What do you see for your future? Do you see a happy marriage? Do you believe for a happy marriage? Or do you see a divorce looming? Do you see separation? Do you see heartache? Do you see somebody else in your life and not your spouse? Faith is believing for what you cannot see will come to pass, but also fear is. Both attract. Both have the same definition. But faith attracts a positive. Fear attracts the negative. And we're children of faith. We are here to attract good things to our life. So success is not a destination, but a journey. A journey. Follow me and I will make you, says Jesus. You know, it's so true that marriage is probably, probably the, 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 the thing that will mature a person better than anything else. You learn how to die to yourself. You learn how to give to another. You learn how to take control of your mood, your anger, your upsetness. And so you learn to live for another person. And so marriage is great in relation to living a Christian life. And so God wants to enjoy it because success, as I said, is not a destination. It's not a matter of arriving while you're alive, but it's not a de- but a journey. So it's privileged to be identified with Christ. And imagine Him wanting to be identified with us. God is not ashamed to be called our God. And God has anointed us with the Holy Spirit. So listen now as I close. God is for me. Yes, that's true. And that's pretty, as I said, like basic living. God is with me. That's true. That's like middle living. But God is in me. That's the highest level. You know, God in your marriage, the threefold cord is not easily broken. So going forward, I want to encourage you to work together, plan together, pray together, speak together, and go back over the series and glean. If you just learn one thing, put it into practice, I know your marriage will improve. So I'm going to pray. And, uh, you know, I've got vows that I've, I've often said in our marriage seminars. And I encourage you even to renew your vows one to one another. Why don't you dig them out? You probably still have them. Why don't you hold hands, husbands and wife, and just renew your vows one to another? You can do it in a holy moment. You can do it without a pastor, without a minister. Just both of you before God, renewing your vows one to another. That's a great way to start a new life. God bless you. Have a happy marriage. Have a happy life. And I pray above all else that you may prosper and be in good health. God bless you. Amen.